Since 2014, Yacht Club Games has just been cranking out banger after banger when it comes to the Shovel Knight series, and Shovel Knight Dig is yet another turn of the crank. Developed in tandem between both Yacht Club and Nitrome, Shovel Knight Dig takes the main ideas of Shovel Knight's 2D platformer gameplay, the shoveling, the bouncing, the secrets hidden in off-pattern sections of the wall, the Mega Man-esque boss battles, and so on and so forth, and fits them all into the structure of a spelunking roguelite. It turns out, it's a great fit, even if the adventure is over rather quickly and offers few compelling reasons to dig deeper. Shovel Knight Dig is a roguelite, and with that comes all of the usual hallmarks of the genre. Permadeath, procedurally generated levels, and small elements of permanent progression that give every successive run the potential to be slightly easier than the last. It also plays nearly identically to the first game of the mainline Shovel Knight series, Shovel of Hope. The blue-clad armored knight controls the same, he's got largely the same set of moves, and fights many of the same enemies with the same behaviors. It's nice to have that familiarity, but the developers smartly don't just rely on nostalgia. There are plenty of new enemies, new relics, and new hazards, most of which are designed to specifically make the most out of the biggest difference in Shovel Knight Dig. Instead of being a traditional side-scroller that has you moving from left to right, Shovel Knight Dig exclusively has you moving from the top to the bottom of each level. This leads to some tricky level design where you have to really be careful about how you descend, because while Shovel Knight can dig sideways and downwards, he cannot dig upwards. So, if you miss a block or enemy to bounce off of, you'll often find yourself unable to get back up. But you can't take things too slow, because there's the constant threat of a one-hit kill excavator that follows you through the level and will make an unwelcome appearance if you take too long on any one section. It all amounts to a great feeling of tension and well-designed risk versus reward in each section of every level. The entire four-level campaign is also filled with tantalizing secret passages, treasure chests, valuable gems, and equipable relics that are often tucked away in hard-to-reach or dangerous areas and further drive home that tough decision-making that is paramount to any good roguelite. In further typical roguelite fashion, in between each run you can buy new relics and accessories that will be added to the pool of potential treasures that you can find on subsequent runs. None of them are truly game-changing, and to be completely honest, you could probably beat the game just as well without buying any of them. Fortunately, it's not just relics and accessories that you can spend your hard-earned loot on. You can purchase shortcut tickets that allow you to begin a run at a deeper stage, you can buy armor sets to have a wide variety of different effects, but only after you find their blueprints hidden in the well, you can buy equipment upgrades that let you carry more items when you're spelunking, and you can buy special keys that unlock more powerful relics, if you can manage to hold onto it long enough to reach a door with a special lock. The one issue with this whole system is that very few of these purchasable items add to any sort of feeling of progression. The armor sets are great, and feel like worthwhile rewards to save your money for, especially the red armor that reduces the damage you take at the expense of the gems that you earn. But many of the unlocks that come from Chester, the blue dude that lives in a chest and sells you accessories for subsequent runs, are so situational or have effects that are so minuscule that it felt like a waste of money and actively detrimental to add them to the potential loot pile. I'd much rather have an item that's useful for a whole run than an elemental resist accessory that's useful for one level and then a waste after that. This hurts the overall feeling of progression and also makes me less interested in attempting to buy all the items after being my first run, because they're kind of just undesirable. Still, it's a fairly minor issue because Shovel Knight Dig is excellent in just about every other area, and that first full successful playthrough was a delight. One of my favorite design choices is that every level has three cogwheels to collect that are always in plain sight, but rarely an easy get. If you manage to collect all three of them, then at the end of the level, you'll be able to choose between an item or getting all of your health back. It's a great feeling to go through a level with low life and know that as long as you're able to collect those three cogwheels, you'll still have a fighting chance and keep your run alive. And on the flip side of that, if you're sailing through a stage and don't need the health, it's also a great feeling to know that you'll be rewarded with some sort of more tangible prize at the end if you're able to snag all of those cogwheels. Another really smart thing that Nitrome and Yacht Club included, and one that feels very much inspired by other excellent roguelites such as Hades and Slay the Spire, is that once you reach the end of the level, you're given a choice as to where you want to go next. 
with little signs that let you know what you can expect from that level's procedural generation and the rewards within. The most desirable paths are typically locked and require you to bring a key to the end of the level, while others will warn you of an abundance of a certain enemy type or that there will be deadly drills that continuously move left and right throughout the stage. They can also let you know of good things that will be in a level, like shops or increased health drops. It's great to have a bit of control over what level you want to tackle next, especially because sometimes it's not an easy choice. It's also worth mentioning that this is the best that Shovel Knight has ever looked. Prior games have intentionally limited their art to mimic the look of an NES game, but Shovel Knight Dig has no such limitation, making it seem like a generational jump from the original games and putting it more in line with the 16-bit SNES and Genesis era. The high quality sprites, animations, and backgrounds all look excellent, and the chiptune soundtrack, once again courtesy of Jake Kaufman, is among the catchiest of the year. It didn't take me too long to reach the end of Shovel Knight Dig's short four level excavation, with my play clock coming in at just under four hours, though that time will obviously vary depending on the person, and for the truly hardcore, there's a hidden ending that adds a new level and several more hours of playtime on top of that. Shovel Knight Dig is yet another treasure dug up by Nitrome and Yacht Club Games that successfully turns the series' signature 2D side-scrolling action into excellent 2D side-falling action. The procedurally generated levels are expertly designed, and though the roguelike progression elements leave a bit to be desired when it comes to motivating further runs after you've completed one, the focus on risk versus reward choices make for a supremely satisfying experience the whole way through. It's a short delve to hit credits, though with a well-hidden post-game awaiting after that, and it's not quite as groundbreaking as either of the Splunkies as far as spelunking roguelikes go, but Shovel Knight Dig is still a gem. For more Shovel Knight Dig, make sure to check out the first minutes of the game and a peek at a later level, the Grub Pit. And for everything else, keep it here on IGN.